One of the cements in Britishness is a very widespread view that Britons are peculiarly free, that their mixed constitution is the envy of the world, that they have more religious tolerance, they have a freer press, they have a more limited monarchy than other European powers. Now, not all of this complacency was entirely unjustified, though it was sometimes excessive. But this cult of superior liberties can be used in two ways. By conservatives, it can be used to legitimize the existing order. But of course, radicals can plug into this too by saying, yes, we are free Britons, and therefore we must become even more free, and we must protect our freedom, and we can only do this by carrying out further reforms. And increasingly from uh, the 1750s, 1760s, you're getting different strands of radical protest saying that Patriotism really belongs to us in a particular way because we are taking this icon of British freedom and we are pushing it further. Despite being considered the freest in the world, British society during the 18th century remained divided by a hierarchy of orders. The ruling aristocratic elite dominated the royal court, the cabinet, both houses of parliament and the law courts, and expected the state churches to teach the common people to obey those in positions of authority. They believed they had a right to govern their social inferiors, and viewed democracy as inherently unstable and destined to degenerate into anarchy. Although only a property minority had an active role in government. This didn't mean that they believed they could act in a tyrannical or oppressive fashion. They were expected to maintain public order, to deliver justice, and to uphold the lives, liberty and property of all British subjects. But during the course of the 18th century, we can see the emergence of groups critical of this social arrangement and coming to demand change and political reform. This development is often associated with that rather vague and amorphous group and irritant of the professional historian, the ever-rising middling classes, many of whom increasingly sought a greater influence in both local and national politics. All the recent historiography of the late 17th and early 18th century stresses the extent to which these sorts of people were already incorporated and active and vocal in politics, already. Um, so whereas an older historiography sometimes made it sound as if they were newly emerging and having their voices heard for the first time, I don't think one can still say that in the light of recent research. But in the first part of the century, they tend to be active and involved under elite leadership that's fairly acceptable to them because the kind of issues which divide people, religious issues, issues about which dynasty should be, should be ruling the country, are not issues which divide opinion along straightforwardly social lines. Um, so you get kind of vertical political groupings within which these middle classes, very broadly defined, can um, play a part, uh, make a contribution. Later in the century, partly what's happening, uh, I think, is that a reshuffling in the positions of the political elite uh, is leading quite a lot of these people who inherit a tradition of political activity to think, we just can't trust these elite leaders anymore. They're all just out for themselves. Uh, none of them are really going to serve the interests of people like us. So we need to find a way of developing an independent voice in politics. So it's not the, it's not the voice, it's the need to, to have an independent voice that's the, uh, that's the novelty. Reform ideas, however, were to come from a wide spectrum. 
from within the political class itself. There were opposition MPs who simply wanted to reform the practices of parliament. And at the other extreme, dissenters and natural rights radicals, advocates of universal suffrage, who wanted a root and branch reform of the system. Part of the reason radicalism is becoming more explicit in the second half of the 18th century is the coming first of the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Competing systems of liberation, competing sets of political ideals. And as a result, you are getting some dissidents, some radicals, some reformers throughout Great Britain and indeed in Ireland arguing that, well, we were the freest people in Europe, but perhaps we no longer are and we must go back and make things even better. You get people who are adopting ideas from the United States and France, as, for example, the idea of a written constitution. So you get someone like Tom Paine, who spends his life moving between Britain, France, and the United States, saying, well, actually, everybody talks about the glories of the British Constitution, but you don't have a constitution because it isn't written down. So we need reform. And many of the supporters for Paine these corresponding clubs that really start mushrooming through Great Britain in the 1790s call themselves patriotic societies because they want to claim patriotism for themselves as people who are struggling to make things better. So there are people um, in the kind of Thomas Paine mould who say uh, what we want is a rational system uh, the British system is not rational, should be reconstructed from the ground up so we can all live better. The 18th century has been a disaster. Self-aggrandising nations have gone around fighting wars that kill people and waste a lot of money and we need to turn our back on all of that kind of thing and create a new sort of, of state and society. And then you get another view, which is that the past is not sacrosanct, but it's only safe and prudent to try to change things gradually. And that's Edmund Burke's position. So Edmund Burke is actually very unusual in the 1790s in that although he's very worried about the French Revolution, he still says reform is a good thing. It's not a common position to hold. There's a third view, which I think people sometimes adopt tactically because it sounds something you're much more likely to get away with than the pay night kind of stuff, and sometimes adopt because um, they think it will resonate with more people, and maybe it in some ways resonates with them too. And, and that's an approach which says, let's not think that anything we want is abstract, uh, let alone foreign. Uh, we quite understand uh, why... It doesn't appeal to people to think we can just discard the whole of English history and start doing things in some new way. But actually, in the English past, perhaps in the quite distant English past, the Anglo-Saxon past, uh, we've got models of how to do things which are the true Englishness. It's a way of presenting the case for radical change that tries to suggest it's grounded in something local and natural to the environment rather than being something philosophers have dreamt up or some kind of foreign import. The outbreak of revolution in France in 1789 was to be a pivotal moment for the reform movements in Britain. Many welcomed what was happening across the Channel as France's own version of the glorious revolution and saw these events as only furthering the cause of reform back home. But as the violence escalated and war with the new France seemed imminent, the very word reform became tainted by its association with these bloody consequences. And that's not to say 
that what you get is straightforwardly a conservative reaction because a lot of these people who are worried about what's happening in France are people who were previously quite interested in reforming things in Britain and they haven't totally abandoned that notion. They've just become very, very cautious about whether this is the right time to be doing it and how one might go about doing it. Of course, the French Revolution taught people that you can change your rulers, uh, that you can abolish feudalism, you can execute your king, uh, you can do all these things. But it seemed to many people in Britain that the immediate consequences of these actions, anarchy in France, civil war, European war, in fact, were so disastrous that we certainly mustn't do them here. And so in, their early, in its early stages, at least, and even, indeed in its middle stages, the French Revolution and its consequences frightened British people off. Now having said that, of course, the theories underpinning the French Revolution about the transformation of subjects into citizens, the need for reform, and the need for better treatment of the lower orders and so forth, these messages, in spite of what was happening in France, in spite of these unhappy consequences, did inspire intellectuals, reformers and so on. And these were the seeds that were to be um, harvested in the, in the 19th century. And in Ireland at least, they were to lead almost directly to the revolution, the attempted revolution of 1798. So we shouldn't eliminate the possibility that the French Revolution had really quite significant consequences upon the British state.